Ooh, foamy and refreshing. Well, summer is coming. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn. This is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to do a go through on an old motor. This is an electric motor from 1934, and I hope to use it to power my MLA 18 die filer project. I don't know if this motor is any good, but we're going to dig into it and find out. So let's go. When last we saw our die filer, it was certainly looking the part and it bounces up and down, but I gotta say, turning things by hand is for chumps. We need an electric motor of some sort. To that end, a awesome viewer sent me this electric motor. It's from uh, a bandsaw that I think he said belonged to his grandfather, and uh, he said it should be still running. And it uh, does seem to spin smoothly. There is some noise in it and a suspicious amount of end float on that shaft, but we'll take a look here in a minute. For you motor nerds, yeah, I see you. Here is the number plate. My loyal patrons, who are sneaky detectives, went and ran all of the numbers on this thing and uh, kind of cross-referenced them with manuals and other information. And we think we've determined that this motor is from 1934. So it's an old girl, but seems to have lots of life left in it yet, I think. And we'll get it apart here and find out. The most difficult part of any motor rebuild is getting the pulley off because inevitably some grease monkey has used an impact wrench and jammed a set screw on there in the wrong place and chewed up the shaft such that the pulley is now welded on there. In with the puller then, this is a gear wrench puller set that I strongly recommend. The great thing about it is that the arms stay in position wherever you put them, they lock in, which solves the most annoying problem that pullers have, which is that the arms are all floppy until you get them set. I'll put a link to this kit below. Some pulling here with the puller, and of course I immediately started distorting the pulley. So that is not going to go well. I'm just going to triple check that that set screw is loose, and indeed it is. So, well, the pulley is not looking good, but I can probably bang it out again, so I'll try pulling it off. But now I have to stop here. This thing is not moving, and I am crushing the pulley. Stronger measures are required, but for that I will need to remove it from this plank here that it's attached to for shipping. I'm pretty sure that a 2-inch slot-headed machine screw with a nylock nut choked all the way down on it is a violation of the Geneva Convention. But I had to wrench this thing off, so you're going to watch me wrench it off. Okay, fine. Nobody should have to do that wrenching, never mind, watch it. The shoulder on the pulley is very close to the motor casing, so my next strategy here was to take a wedge and just try tappy tap tapping in between them there, maybe drive the pulley outward that way. This sadly got me nowhere, so it's in with the heat. Most people know that if you heat something up to expand it, you can usually break it free of whatever it's stuck to, and even if it doesn't expand, usually just the heat will break whatever goo or resin is causing it to be stuck on the shaft. As the old joke goes, it can't be stuck if it's a liquid. Well, that joke is slightly ironic in this case because I ended up melting that pulley before it got appreciably hot. So this is not going to work, and now my workshop smells like I've been soldering. This pulley is clearly some sort of really cheap tin, lead, zinc alloy, something like that. Thus ends the non-destructive attempt at removal, and well, now let's just get serious about this. Put the puller back on there, and I put some pieces of scrap in there to minimize the distortion. Not because I care about saving this pulley, but because the puller isn't going to work if it's just distorting the pulley. And now it finally started to move. I briefly entertained notions of using this thing anyway after hammering it back into shape in all of its melty charm. But no, there is in fact a crack on the back of it there that I probably did with the puller, so... Yeah, this thing is going in the scrap bin. A new pulley will be required, but more on that later. For now, let's turn our attention to the electrical. The cord on it is a little short, so I'm going to go ahead and replace that. This little box here no doubt contains the brushes, assuming this is a brushed AC motor, which I'm sure it is based on the size and age. And sure enough, there are the brushes. They look to be in very good shape, plenty of life left on them. The spring-loaded mechanism still works well and there's lots of excess material on there, which is typical for AC motors, unlike DC motors where the brushes wear out pretty quickly because, of course, DC motors use a split commutator, and the little split line on the commutator is what wears out the brushes. On a brushed AC motor like this, there's a pair of slip rings in there which are continuous, so there's nothing really to wear out the brushes. 
All right, let's get this thing apart. I want to go through it and see what kind of condition the bearings are in. Like I said, it does have some noise in it and there's some end floats, so I want to make sure that everything's actually okay in there or replace whatever needs replacing. These old motors come apart really easily. That end cap is still a little stuck, so I'm going to go ahead and take the base off as well, just in case there's something in there that's retaining the end caps. Once in a while, that is the case. Not in this case, though. This motor is very simple in design, as is typical of these older motors. It's a very elegant design, pretty much how motors were put together for 100 years. Definitely nothing but time holding those end caps on anymore, though, so a little tap tap tapping with a rubber mallet until I see the gap starting to widen there, so I know I'm winning, and that should come apart. Moment of truth here. Oh, 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 looks pretty good in there. It's a lot of sawdust in there, but nothing obviously wrong in here. The shaft looks really good, so that's a good sign. Somebody's been oiling this thing. For the front cap, though, I don't want to pull it off without cleaning up that shaft first. You don't want to pull a chewed up shaft through a bearing because you'll destroy the bearing in the process. So make sure to get all the burrs and stuff off of there that are caused by, once again, Grease monkeys hammering on pulleys incorrectly. Tappy tap tap on the front cover and it comes loose. And I'm sliding it off carefully here, just feeling for any resistance. And it, indeed there is resistance there. So I stop here and do some more work on that shaft. There shouldn't be any resistance there. You want that shaft to be completely burr free before you pull it through the bearing. So I did some work with stones here and more emery paper. Note that I'm dropping my hand on each stroke. That prevents the stone from making a flat spot on the shaft. And just continue that until everything is deburred. And now that thing slides off of there with no resistance at all. So that's a good sign. Shaft is cleaned up and I have not damaged that bearing. There's even more sawdust in this end. Presumably this was the end facing the saw, so I guess that makes sense. Now let's get the rotor out of there. As is typical for most AC motors, the rotor is the electromagnet and the stator is a series of permanent magnets. Now that I've got it apart, while I clean it up, we can answer a few questions about this motor. First of all, it is a bushing motor, not a bearing motor, so that's why it has the end float in it. That's normal for this type of motor. They rely on the magnetic fields to self-center the rotor in the stator so they don't need any kind of thrust surface or anything else to locate the shaft laterally in the motor. That does mean that they can only handle side loads, of course. This is probably the most basic design of AC motor. There are a lot of types of these things, but this is a very basic one. Four field coils in the rotor. And if you noticed on the number plate, it runs at 1725 RPM. The reason for that speed, you might be wondering why isn't it 1800 RPM for a 60 Hertz motor, because of course AC motors use the frequency of the power coming in on your AC to regulate their rotation. AC motors have what's called slip in them. What that means is that the magnetic field in the motor is spinning faster than the actual motor itself is. This is called slip. It's typically 3 to 4 percent which means that the mechanical part of the rotor, the actual physical rotor, is rotating 3 to 4% slower than the magnetic field is. The magnetic field is pulling the rotor forward through space, essentially. And the heavier the load is on the motor, the more of that slip that you'll see. So when idling, an electric motor may well run at full 1800 RPM, but when fully loaded, it'll run at its maximum slip. I mentioned that this is a bushing or plane bearing motor, not a roller bearing motor. The way these work is that there are plain bronze bushings in the ends that hold the shaft, and there are spiral lubrication grooves in there that are connected to the lubricators on the ends of the motor. So I want to clean out those lubrication grooves. Sometimes they're full of, you know, old crud, resin, things like that, old oil. And I want to make sure that the lubricators are functioning. A plane bearing motor like this will as is self-evident, run 100 years if properly lubricated. Sometimes you pull these open and they're full of grease because people have put grease in them. You're not supposed to do that, you know, things like that. But this motor has had a good life. Somebody's been taking care of it. Now I want to kind of rejuvenate the lubrication system here because it is pretty old and dry. 
the felt in there. Those tubes on the outside are packed full of felt, and the felt has to be saturated with oil for this whole system to work. The felt rubs on the shaft as it spins, and that pulls oil off of the felt, and then it runs down those spiral grooves to lubricate the shaft. So on an old machine like this, the felt can be dried out, so you just kind of set it up somewhere like on the back of my bench here and over the course of 24 hours I just keep topping up the oil as it soaks into the felt until the oil is coming out of the felt inside the bushings and also there are weep holes on the bottoms of the lubricators and when oil is coming out of there then you also know that the felt is saturated. On to electrical now. I went down to the hardware store and got myself a new pigtail here for this motor. If you can't find pigtails you can also just buy the cheapest extension cord and cut the plug off. Honestly, extension cords are so cheap these days that that's a pretty reasonable thing to do. The live and neutral are just pinned underneath the brushes by these brass nuts here. The ground wire there would be a modern addition. This motor originally would not have been grounded because, of course, household electrical in those days in the 30s was not grounded. In fact, they didn't even distinguish between live and neutral in those days. Sometimes if you touched two adjacent appliances at the same time where neutral and live were reversed on the casings of those appliances, you'd get a little love zap. This motor is electrically isolated on the base there. You can see that piece of plastic in the back to try and prevent that effect, but eh, it didn't work that well. Nowadays appliances are grounded and or made of plastic, aka double insulated, and we're a lot more careful about where live and neutral go, so that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. To crimp a new connector on there, I've got a torque controlled ratcheting crimping tool here, which I strongly recommend. I'm a bit of a snob about these things. Don't ever use those auto parts store garbage crimpers like you see under my hand there that I used as the stripper. They're perfectly fine as strippers, but as crimpers, they are garbage. A lot of people think that crimps aren't good. It's because everybody's using crappy crimping tools. If you use a proper ratcheting torque controlled system like this, that crimp is actually stronger than soldering and you could hang the entire motor off of that thing. Next, I transfer the strain relief over from the old cable. This is just a little clip made of some sort of pot metal that you can just squish over the outer sheath of the new cable there, and then that fits into a little slot there on the brush box, and that acts as a strain relief. And then I install the new cable here underneath the brushes. After that, I really couldn't find anything else wrong with this motor. I mean, the bushings are in excellent shape and the lubricators are working, so. I'm just going to put it back together. At this stage, you want to make sure to get the rotor in there quite quickly before chevrons start locking, because you don't know what's going to come through there. Why didn't they just keep the iris closed? Nobody knows. There's some other checks you can do here, like checking the resistance of the windings to make sure that they're intact and so on, but honestly, a visual inspection to make sure that the coating, the enamel or epoxy on a modern motor is intact, it's really all you need to do, because if those windings are damaged, there's nothing you can do anyway, and the motor is going to be scrapped. I mean, you can have the motor rewound, but that's not going to be worth it unless the motor is rare or valuable. So you really don't have anything to lose by just turning it on. I'm giving everything some startup oil here, of course, as I reassemble. Once again, though, the shafts are in great shape. So this motor has been taken care of, which is really nice. Clearly, people have been oiling it throughout its 90 years on this earth. Get everything back assembled here. Get the threaded rods back through the center. One thing about these motors is that the end caps can be rotated to any of the four positions, and that's so that however the motor is mounted, you can get the lubricators facing upwards, because of course they are, at the end of the day, kind of a gravity-dependent system. The felt is independent of gravity, but the little cups there need gravity to feed the oil down into the felt. Of course, there's no switch on this motor. I don't want to just plug it in as is, so I've got this little inline switch here that I use for testing this sort of thing. I plug that in and, well, let's give it a whirl. Yeah, look at that. It's running great. Smooth and quiet. The camera is a little blurry there because it's attached to the bench and the motor is causing some slight vibration to get up into the camera there. Sorry about that, but that motor is running very, very well. Very pleased with that. Well, I gotta give it a try on the die filer now, right? For that, I'm going to need oil in this thing. So the kit doesn't actually include any instructions on how much oil to put in it. They have some suggestions for type of oil. I'm using a basic 30 weight pinion oil here. So I scientifically determined that that is the correct amount. Sure. There's no fill plug on it, so probably the amount of oil is supposed to be low because there's no, again, fill or drain of any sort on it. You're just supposed to open the back up. So I'm guessing it's not supposed to have a lot of oil in it. 
I put a lot in. Yeah, let's see what happens. For mock-up here, I'm going to temporarily set it up on a scrap of wood I found on the pile. Eventually, I have decided that I'm going to build a stand or kind of a, a miniature bench for this thing that's going to mount the motor below the bench and the belt will run through it. And that'll keep the motor out of the way of filings and it'll be nice and compact. But for now, I'm going to mock it up on this board. I could temporarily use it on this board as well if I just clamp it to the bench. I'll need a better way to tension the belt than what you're about to see. But in the final stand that I'm going to build, of course, there will be a belt tensioning system. But for now, I'm just going to kind of mount the two things to the board and get some tension on the belt, just enough that it'll run and we can see this thing in action. Since I've reached my one homemade pulley per project limit, you will notice that I've got a standard hardware store zinc cast pulley on the motor now. I had to go and buy the pigtail for the electrical anyway, so I just grabbed a pulley and didn't feel like making another one. All right, here goes. First test of this die filer under power. Let's see what happens. Wow, look at it go. It's running faster than I imagined. It's running well, but it is... It is making a ticking noise. You hear that? Let's investigate that a little bit because it should be running quieter than that, I think. First step is to test it by hand, see if I can reproduce that noise. The answer is no, I can't. I don't hear anything in there at all when I turn up by hand. It seems very, very smooth. So whatever's happening maybe only happens when it's running at high speed. I'll pull the cover off here and have a look, see if we can figure out what's going on. Hopefully I can do this without dumping oil everywhere. Oh my, would you look at that? It is Oil Julius in there. That oil is very, very foamy after being beaten to death by that yoke. I suspect that's down to two things. Probably I've used too much oil and too light of an oil, perhaps. Interestingly, though, I think with the cover off, I can reproduce the noise. Take a look and a listen. It seems to be cavitation caused by the yoke slamming into the overly deep pool of oil at the bottom of this thing. No doubt that's what's causing the foaming as well. Although, again, I think I used too light of an oil, and this is also not technically a recirculating oil. It's steam engine bearing and pinion oil, which is designed for total loss oiling systems. So all around, probably not a good choice of oil on my part. Let's try that again with 75W80 gear oil this time. This is a heavier oil, and I'm going to put less of it in there. This is also a sulfated oil, which is a $5 word that means smells really, really bad. This is an oil typically used in manual transmissions, non-slip differentials, and other oil bath gearbox type situations. Importantly, it's a non-detergent oil. Unlike, say, automotive engine oil, detergent oils should only be used in pressurized oil systems with an oil filter because the detergents hold particulates in suspension so they can be captured by the filter. However, in an oil bath situation like this, you want particulates to sink to the bottom so they'll stay clear of the mechanism. Okay, take two with a heavier oil and less of it. Hey, hey, look at that! Oh, that's exciting. You can probably hear my spontaneous celebrating in the background. Oh, it runs so beautifully now. So, the right oil was the ticket. Standard metric horns of victory. I'm curious how fast this thing is actually running. I guesstimated that it should run somewhere around the 800 RPM that the kit recommends. This may run a little bit slower than expected because the hardware store pulley that I have on there is a little bit smaller than the original one was that I calculated. But survey says 723 RPM, so that's great. It's a little bit slower than maybe the kit suggests, but I think that'll be just fine. Well, it looks like it's going to work. There's still lots more to do here. Obviously, I need a belt tensioning system and I need to finish some of the seals and it needs to be painted and some other things. We still have to make the files, of course. Die filer needs files, so that's going to be interesting. So stay tuned for all of that. 
I hope you've enjoyed this project so far. Thanks to all my patrons especially, who make all this content possible. And I will see you next time. Look at that. That motor's got another 90 years in it.